Hi, my name is Bora Jambula and this is the course Parallel Programming. We will be together with this course in this semester and uh, this course Parallel Programming will be held face to face. So we will uh, complete this course in our classrooms, in our faculty and it will be on Mondays and the morning session will be on the 9.30 a.m. and also the evening session will be on the 5 p.m. all right and also we can say it like 1700 all right and also I will upload some uh, videos some additional videos like this one to uh, provide some resources to our classroom who are not able to come to our classroom uh, they can they can be covid positive or uh, they can be in quarantine so i will upload these videos to uh, provide to you uh, a brief summary of what we are going to learn in the classrooms and uh, i want to say that uh, these videos will be about i think uh, 30 minutes but uh, we will talk about the same subject in the classroom like two hours. So I strongly recommend you to come to our classroom, uh, which is C208. And it's a computer lab, as you know. And I strongly recommend you to come to our classroom. But if you are not able to come to our classroom, then you can uh, follow the subjects uh, by using these videos. And this is a course about parallel programming and, of course, this is a course about uh, HPC, which we call HPC, which stands for the High Performance, sorry, I want to delete this, High Performance Computing. High-performance computing uh, is a term uh, which we can apply to the calculations, scientific calculations by using the computer, and also we use it in web programming, in game programming. So uh, you are going to need uh, this concept in your professional career a lot, I think. So it's an important course, and we will learn... Uh, very good things, very fun things uh, to improve our algorithms, improve our codes, right? To get uh, high performance from them. And today we are going to start with a very basic example, a very basic experiment, uh, I can say. And we are going to try to find the value of pi. And of course, we know the value of pi is. 3.14159 and something like this and it goes like this but we are going to try to simulate by using the Monte Carlo simulation and try to find the value and uh, let's get started I'm going to start by drawing an axis an x and y axis and also I think we know each other so maybe maybe we work together with the course statistics or uh, the course numerical analysis so i think you know me and you know how i handle a course Let's say that this is x-axis and this is y-axis, all right? And also, I'm going to draw a circle, like, let me choose this color now. And I want to try to draw a circle like this. And it's surprisingly very good, I think. And also, I need to draw a square. And for this, Let's 
use the orange color. All right, like this one. All right, let's turn back to black. So, this is a circle and this is a square. And this is x axis, this is y axis, this is the point with the x value 1, and of course the y value 0, and also this is uh, a point with the y value 1 and x value 0. And this is the value. This is the point with the coordinates and minus one and zero, and this is the point with the coordinates with the zero and minus one. All right. So also, I think it will be good if we write like this. So this is the coordinates one and zero, and this is the coordinates like zero and one, and this point has the coordinates the minus one and zero. This one has the coordinates 0 and minus 1. All right, so we have a circle, we have a square. And I want to start with the start by calculating the area of the square, this square, this orange one. So the area of this square, let me call it like A, or let me write it in details area of the square we can calculate it by multiplying the length of the this edge so i should multiply like two by two right because this edge has the length two and also this edge has the length two so it will make four and then i want to calculate the area of the this blue one and the area of the circle as you know we can use the formula which is equal to pi r square and this r is diameter and this r is one so we have the value like pi all right so we have the area of the square which is four and we have the area of the circle which equals to pi and uh, i want to i want to run an experiment so i want to throw some uh, points on uh, this structure on this square and like this one let me put here a point like this one and this point has the coordinates like x and y so let me write it like this this point has the has the coordinates like x and y and the distance to the origin of this point let me draw like this the distance of this point to the origin let me call it like r and we can calculate the r by using the formulation which is r square equals to x square plus y square right and x here is a random a random value and also y is a random value in the range of of course between the minus one and plus one for x or for y it's the same thing between the minus one and plus one and then we get the value of r and for a random point, if we have an r value which is less than 1, or we can call it like less or equal than 1, then we can say this point is in our circle. And it's an inner point. 
right? And now, let me think, uh, think like this. And if we increase the number of these points, what if I put a put another random point here, another random point here, another random point here, another here, here, and let me increase the number of the points. Of course, some points will be will be in the area which is out of our circle so we will have some points in our circle and we will have some points out of our circle like this drawing all right let me increase the number of the points and if we have an enough number of points then we can say we can say let's call them uh, the number of inner points by using the letter i number of inner points and let me call n total number total number of points all right and the ratio of these two number, these two integer, like i over n, i over n, will be equal to ratio between the areas of this circle and the square, right? So we can call it like the ratio of the areas, like pi over 4. So we can get the formula like pi will be equal to 4 times i over n. And if we have enough number of total points, then we can calculate the number of uh, the value of pi uh, accurately. And this method is called the Monte Carlo simulation uh, to calculate the value of pi, Monte Carlo simulation of pi, right? Because we are using the random points to simulate the coordinates of these uh, points. So, of course, we are going to start to start with this example and of course we are going to need to use a programming language and for this course i prefer to use python python and as you know python is an interpreted language so uh, it's extremely slow uh, among other programming languages like uh, C, C++, uh, Fortran, or some other language, uh, which, uh, which is a compiled language. But Python is a very uh, user-friendly language to learn, right? So it's, uh, it's very easy to develop something. It's very easy to learn the details of a programming language or uh, the details of a programming concept by using Python. But uh, it's very slow when we want to calculate something by using Python. So uh, Python is, uh, I think, the best choice uh, for a course like this, a parallel programming or high performance computing, because we need to. What is the problem? Because we need to uh, increase the performance of Python a lot. We don't need to increase the performance of uh, C++, for example, but if we use Python, then we need to increase the performance of this programming language. So we are going to use Python for this uh, course. And of course, I'm now I'm going to write some code by using 
Python. And if you don't know anything about Python or if you are not familiar with the Python, don't worry. We are going to start from scratch and we are going to learn everything about the Python. So to use Python, uh, we can uh, we can we can use two uh, methods. We can install the Python to our computers as a standalone uh, interpreter, and we can use it offline, or we can use it by using Kaggle. Uh, so we can write our codes in a not in a Python notebook. You can you can select any method that you want and I'm going to show you the first Kaggle option. Kaggle is an online platform to create Python notebooks and you can click code and then you can click this button to create a new notebook. And this is a default version of our notebook. And I'm going to click this one to add a code cell to my notebook. And of course, I'm going to start with a very traditional way to write hello world to the screen. And I'm going to use the function print and then hello world. Let me run the cell. Of course, uh, uh, the first step is slow in Kaggle because it's an online platform and the session is starting just right now and we are going to wait it and then we have our hello world here all right you can use it from Kaggle or you can install the Python notebook structure to your computers uh, for example I prefer the anaconda for this let me Hide these writings for a moment. And uh, Anaconda is a Python distribution. It includes all these useful tools. And in Anaconda, we have our Jupyter Notebook. And the Jupyter Notebook is the approximately the same thing with the Kaggle, but it's, uh, it's the offline version of the Python Notebook. So you can launch by clicking this button. And then it runs on our local host, so it's offline. And we can create by clicking this new button, and I'm going to create a Python 3 notebook. It's the same thing with the Kaggle, and so I can run the same command by doing this. All right, then we have our hello world. But of course, I have a standalone version, a standalone interpreter for Python in my computer, and I want to use it by using an IDE. An IDE is an integrated development environment, and I prefer PyCharm. So I'm going to use it. Let me run, or let me create a new folder here. And let's say lecture zero one. And I want to create a new PyCharm project in this folder. So we have our problem. We want to calculate the value of pi, and we need a programming language, and we prefer Python. First, we are going to learn how to write codes in Python, and then we are going to learn how to increase our code, increase the performance of our code in Python. I'm going to delete these codes now because I want a fresh start. So I have my pain.py file, and let me try the same thing. But first, I think I should increase the size of the font, make it clearer for you. All right, font here. You can use the professional version of PyCharm by using your 
edu email address, all right? Let me use it like 22. Maybe 28. All right, it's okay. Let me do the same thing. Run to the world. All right, save it and let me run it. All right, we have our hello world here. So, let me take a look at again our problem. And now we have to, I think we have to generate a random number, a set of random number to use uh, as the coordinates of our points. And then uh, we are going to try to calculate the value of pi. So first, I think, I don't know anything about Python, so I think I need to get some help from Google to learn to how to create, how to generate uh, random numbers in Python. So I'm going to take a look at Google and let's say Python random number generator. I think it works. All right, let's click the first one. It says pseudo random number generator. So in programming language, we don't get the exact the random numbers. We we can just get the pseudo random numbers. All right, this is the first thing we should learn. And I see we have a library with the name random. All right, for example, like this one, we can uh, generate these random numbers by using the range option. And I think this is a loop by using the for keyword. And this is the option for the generating the integer values. All right, then it will work for me, but uh, I cannot see how to change the change the limits of the interval because I want to generate my random number between minus one and plus one. So I'm going to search it again. Now I can understand that I'm going to use the use a library, use a uh, use the random library with the name random, but uh, I want to generate my random numbers between range. I think this is the correct option, how to get a random number between a float range. And this is a float number. My coordinates are float numbers. And I think this one will work for me from the random us from the random library and I I assume that uh, you know the object-oriented programming right so uh, I'm not going to tell you the aspects of the object-oriented programming like what is a class what's a library or what is a function what is a method but uh, I just try to learn something about Python and I see I'm going to use the random library and the uniform method of this library with the limits of the interval. All right, I'm going to use this one. Let me turn back to my pi file, which is opened in the PyCharm. I'm going to first import my library with the name random. All right. And then first I'm going to try to generate a number for x and from the random library i'm going to use uniform methods and i'm going to give you the limits of our interval which is minus one and plus one all right 
And let me check the value of x now. I'm going to save this file and run this file now. All right, we have a random number, I think, which is equal to minus point uh, six three one four two and goes like this. Let me run this again to get uh, another number if I did it correctly. So we have a different number now. We have a different number now. All right, it works. So now I get to how to create. I understand to how to generate a random number between a range. So uh, I can generate. A real number, a floating number for the other coordinate, which is y, between the same range, minus 1 and plus 1. Now I have my two coordinates, and I can calculate the value of r. So, let me take the second power. And, of course, if I don't know how to calculate the power of a number in Python, I can, I can search it in Google and let me say Python power of number, like this. And it says the asterisk asterisk operator in Python used to raise the number on the left to the power of the exponent of the right. Alright, so it will work for me like this, x squared plus y squared. And of course, I should take the square root of this number, uh, of this result, to find the correct value of r. But uh, it's an extra operation, so I don't want to do this because uh, in the in the values which is close to one, it doesn't matter if I have an r square value which is below one. So the square of this number, square of this number is also below one, and also I have a value uh, which is above one, which is larger than one. Then the square of this number is also above one, larger than one. So I don't want to take the square root of this result uh, because I don't want to use another operation. All right. So now I have my r value. And I want to I want to see the values of x, and I think I can use like this x, uh, y, and r. And I hope Python will show me the values of all these three variables. And I want to run my code again. And we have values like 0 0.85 and minus 0 0.04 and uh, 0 0.72. Alright, now I should check the condition. I should check the condition, which is uh, if this value is larger than 1 or not. Alright, then let me turn back to Google. And let's say Python if else. I think this one will work for me. All right, I know all these operators. And that is a good example for me. If some condition and a semicolon, and there's a top indent here. This is a very important point for Python. So in Python, we should be very careful about the indentions because uh, let me write the if condition first, if, and also let me use it like this. I don't have to calculate and store it in another variable and I can directly calculate x squared plus y squared here and less or equal them one and let's say that semicolon and now we put a one top character all right so this line is this line will be in our if block all right this is a very important for python you cannot use some 
some this parenthesis or something like this. It's not C, it's not Java. So you should use the indentions like this. So if we are in uh, the circle, then we can write print you are in. And also, of course, we can use an else keyword and then we can write you are out like this. Save it and run it. We are in because our value is 0 0.67 and then run again and we are in again. We are in again. And now we are out. All right, we have the coordinates like uh, minus 0 0.46 something and minus 0.92 something and we have our r value like 1.07 and then our point is outside uh, our circle outside of our circle outside area for our circle so to calculate the value of pi now uh, we should create a loop i think because we have to generate a lot of numbers so i'm now I'm curious about the how to use loops in Python, so I'm going to search for Python loops. And we have for loops, and of course we have while loops, and if it's a numerical loop, then we can we can use the for keyword, and if it's a conditional loop, then we can use a while uh, keyword. So uh let me find a numerical loop yes like this one and in this example it says for x in range 6 uh, print x in python uh, the the index starts from 0 so in range 6 means uh, in the elements of 0 1 2 uh, 3, 4, and 5. All right, we have six elements in the range 6, and we are going to start from 0. So it will loop with the x values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I'm going to do the same thing. And of course, I'm going to start from here because all these codes should be in our loop, and I'm going to use for keyword. And let's say for i in the range something, for example, like 100, and I'm going to use the semicolon. So if we put all these codes in our for loop, then we have to use the tab character uh, starting for the, all these lines, like this one. Then we can put them in a for loop. But uh, I think we don't use uh, an index, an integer like this, i, uh, to get the number of the loop, right? So we don't, use, we don't want to use, we don't have to use an index now. And in Python, we can use an underscore like this with the for keyword if we don't want to use an integer for an index of our loop. Right, so I'm going to change this i with an underscore, and this part will run 100 times, and it's okay. All right, and let me change it to 10, and I'm going to run it to show the result. All right, now we have generated 10 different. 10 different coordinate sets and we have I think one outer point and two here another outer point and we have eight points in our circle and two points outside uh, our circle and now I should calculate the values of n and i and here I'm going to start with a declaration with the value of n and let's say 100 and let's use this value here for the limit of our for loop like this for underscore in range n so this loop will run n times and sorry i'm going to turn on 
my light. I think it won't help so much, but I think it's better now. All right. So we have our loop. We have the limits n equals 100. And let me count the number of inner points. So I'm going to start from 0, of course. And every time I catch a point inside my circle, then I'm going to increase the value of i. So I'm going to delete this comment print you are in, and I'm going to increase the value of i by 1. So I don't need this part anymore. You are out part. I'm going to delete this. So I think we are OK now. And I think we don't need this part. Let me delete this. and. At the end of our codes, I should calculate the value of pi, of course. So I'm going to write like this, pi equals the 4 times i over n. All right. So it will calculate the value of pi for me. And I'm going to see the value of pi. And also, I want to see the value of i and n. Sorry, not that, but it's going to be a comma like this. Let me save this and run this for you. All right, so I'm complete now. So I have a value for pi, which is equal to 3.48, and I have 87 inner points of total number of 100 points. It's a very rough simulation. So let me increase the value. Let me increase the number, uh, the value of n, uh, for example, like 1000. And run it again. This is okay. And let's say 10,000. It's so much closer now. Let's increase it again. And now we have a much closer value for the pi. But uh, I don't like this output, uh, which includes the just the uh, numbers. Uh, for now, I'm going to hide these writings and put this window here. And I want to I want to see the results in a in a better way. So I I should I want to search for the for example Python print four methods Python output formatting. All right. What does it say? It says, for example, you can create a format string like this, uh, like gigs, semicolon, uh, percentage symbols, and 2D. And we have another symbol here, percentage symbol 5.2F. And as a second argument, I think this is the second part of the comment. So we have another percentage symbol here, and uh, it gives us an integer and also a floating number, float, float value, a real number. And I think this part goes to this part, and this number goes to this part. And also, we have another example here, and it works in the same way. So we have total students of a D, and we have this value. And we have a 2D here, uh, which is equal to this value. All right. And we have a usage here, usage instruction here. And it works uh, the way, like I said before. So this value 
comes here and this value comes here and we have this format string here and the usage is like this we have a percentage symbol and then flex and then width and then precision and then type all right so i think this is for the for an integer so if we use it like this we have width and we have type so percentage 2d is equal to width with two characters and the type is decimal all right the type is for an integer all right and this is percentage symbol 5.2 f is the width is five here and the precision part is two here so we will have two numbers after the point and then our type is f and i think it's it stands for a float number all right we have all these numbers with the float numbers so we should use uh, like this f's so i'm going to change it to like pi equals to percentage let's say 10.5f all right and then the value of i of course we don't have all these numbers with the float numbers we have two integers for i and n so i'm going to use it i here and i will be equal to a t so percentage let's say 60 and then we have our n let's use 10 d percentage 10 d all right let's change it also to 10 10 d and 10 d all right so a double q here and then a percentage symbol like this and then we have our values pi i and n all right let's run this now we have these numbers now so it's better and also we have a warning from pycharm here we have two weak warnings what are they it says you have missing white space after a comma and the mark is here so pycharm is a very strict ide so it wants us to put a white space here after the comma and we have we are okay now and also if you put just one line one blank line here so it will do the same thing you know it does this it does this not now but it does this let me run it again it doesn't say it now but it says all right so it's a very strict ide to prevent you from making mistakes by making mistake mistakes while you are writing python codes all right now we have our formatted outputs and these space are too much what if i delete this part and just use the point 5f and let me run it again and it works All right so now the width the total width of this output is dynamical dynamic uh, but i want to see five characters after the that after the point all right so this part has five characters length uh, width sorry but uh, this part is dynamic so i'm going to do the same thing here just use t and here i'm going to just use t and again all right so now let's increase the value a little one million again now we should wait and let's say 
and millions. And now we have to wait. So if it's about the performance, so if this course will be about the performance, so I'm curious about the running time of this script, of this Python script. So now uh, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to find the running time of this script. But first we should wait to the end. All right, we have these values. This is a close value for pi. And let's search for it now. I'm going to look for the Python time interval. All right, this one works for me. Calculating time difference, yeah, because I sh I should I want to get the time uh, somewhere like here at the beginning of my script, and also I'm going I will do the same thing at the end of my script, and I want to calculate the time difference between these two uh, times. So I'm going to click this one to see how can we do this. This one use the date time library, and this one I think is okay. So there is a library called time, and also it includes a function, a method which is called time, and we can get the start time and end time, and then we can calculate the difference of these two time values. I'm going to do this. So I'm going to import. Uh, time library now All right and at the beginning of my loop i'm going to get the start time by using the time method of the time library and at the end of my script i'm going to do the same thing and time which is equal to time dot time all right and now let me put and put this number in another print function time and now I'm going to use the formatted output like I have learned half minutes ago and so I'm going to use the percentage symbol and then dot and then five and then f for float floating number so now the percentage symbol and calculate the difference between the end time and then start time. All right. Let's give me the results. Save and run. Let me let me wait for my script. How much? Twenty four point seven seconds. All right. The time method of the time library. actually gives us a time difference a time difference between the and we can put comments in our codes by using this symbol or this symbol this is the same thing so the time method from time library is gives us the time difference between now and the January 1st of the year 1970. All right, so we can call it like timestamp. All right, time spent, time timestamp of uh, Unix systems. So we get the 
time difference from the January 1st from 1970 here and then here and then we calculate the difference of these two time differences to get the running time of our script all right and let me delete this part and i said you at the beginning of this lecture i said to you python is a very slow language python is a very slow interpreted language if we want to calculate something let me check this now if it is or not and i have an ubuntu terminal in my windows 10 and i want to write a fortran code now to check it if fortran is really faster than a python script and i'm going to do the same thing i'm going to do, i'm going to write the same code but of course in fortran and i'm going to use this n value in fortran 10 millions i'm going to do the same thing i'm going to do the same calculation and i want to see the actual difference so where am i now pwd i'm in my home folder let me let me create a, for example find f 95 file which is a fortran source code file to calculate the pi value so i'm going to use our lovely text editor vim and find pi.f95 and now i'm going to start to write this code let's give a name to our program then end our program before i forget this all right i'm not going to tell you all thing about this fortran code because the subject is python here but i'm going to make it fast so i'm going to define the integers because fortran is a compiled language so i should use an n and i and this i for uh, the inner points and I need another integer for our for loop in Fortran because uh, we, we cannot use the underscore so symbol in Fortran like we did in Python so I'm going to define another integers for the start time and end time i'm not going to use the end keyword because it's something like different in fortran and also i need another integer and i'm going to define the real numbers now floating numbers which are x y r and also elapsed which i'm going to use to calculate the time difference so I'm going to do the same thing so n will be equal to 10 millions 10,000 and 10 millions i did it correct right so again i'm going to start with the value i equals zero and let's call our system clock and save this value to our variable with the name starts and also I should learn the value of count rates and also i should start my random number generator with with uh, seed with the function s runs and i'm going to use the system clock for this all right so i have started my random number generator now and i'm going to write the for loop with do keyword which does the same thing in fortran 
So, of course, I need to use i i now for the index of our loop, and it will start from 1 all the way up to n. And then I'm going to generate a random number using the rand function, but the rand function in Fortran will generate a random real number between 0 and 1. So I should transform the value to the range uh, starting from minus 1 to plus 1. So let's start from minus 1 with a double precision real number. So I, I'm going to use the minus 1.d0. It means double precision real number plus friends, which is in the range between 0 and 1. So I should uh, multiply this value with 2 to get a range starting from minus 1 to the plus 1. So times 2 is 0. And then y equals to minus 1 plus random number between 0 and 1, of course, multiplied by 2. Then calculate r, which is equal to x square plus y square and if we have a number which is less or equal so i'm going to use this keyword dot l e dot it means less or equal than one and then we are going to increase the value i all right so now i will be equal to i plus one and then and if and then and do here and then of course we are going to call our system clock again to get the time again system clock finish now we can calculate the time difference to our elapsed variable. It's the difference between finish and starts. And I'm going to transform this value to a real number by dividing by a double precision. Double press is 1. And then count rates. The details of this calculation is not important for you, but I just want to complete my code now. So I'm going to do the same thing to put the output in a formatted way. So I'm going to use the write function of Fortran and let's say pi equals to it's similar but not the same f 8.5 and then what do we have i all right i will be equal to an integer with the bit eight characters all right we should give the width of the integers in Fortran, not like Python. We cannot use the dynamical widths. So here, let's say, I think 8 will, be, will not be enough. So let's give another integer. All right, so let's calculate the value of pi four, sorry, four times i over n, and then the value of i, and then the value of n. And of course, I want to see the time difference. 
so now time sorry time is equal to something like f 10.6 And then our time difference. I think we're okay now. Let's save this file and then compile this file. We have an error. Because we don't use the comma, I'm going to correct this. Not dot here. They should be commas. Save and then compile. What do we have? Let me check it again. All right, we should have a single shoot symbol here. Like this. Sorry. like this all right we have it now let me run our program and we have our value we have a close value for the value of pi we have the value of 3.14226 and we have inner points in python 7 millions uh, 854,664 and here uh, we have a close value 8 uh, sorry 7,855,646 and we did the same thing 24 seconds in python but 0 0.324 seconds in Fortran. Let me calculate the difference. So twenty four point seven eight seven two two divided by zero point three two four. It's 76 times faster so this course will be about this difference so we are going to try to make python this fast all right so we are going to try to make python this fast we are going to try so we will continue uh, with the next lecture. Okay, see you next week.